GM to everybody. And with the backdrop of camaraderie and teamwork and just solving out with an MVHQ for, you know, one of our colleagues, it would not be a better time to be able to to kind of now have this discussion now that everybody's comfortable. You know, that's obviously the the background and backdrop of numbers therapy and where it started from is is a community project. It's great that that's kind of at the backdrop and that also everyone's okay. So with that said, welcome everybody to Numbers Therapy episode 26. Today's episode title, Rating the Top NFT Projects and Their Futures. A uh, couple housekeeping points before we dive in. Episode 26 doesn't look like a, a serious number, but it's actually another big milestone because it means Numbers Therapy is officially around now for half a year. So super exciting. Uh, in that vein, I want to really thank everyone for submitting their thoughtful survey responses recently. As you know, this is an MBHQ first show. And the feedback you've given is just really useful in helping us improve the show even more. So with that in mind, we'll be raffling a few allow lists for those people who filled the survey and Poop will be announcing that too. Also, we tend to function in a pretty agile way. So if you did not catch the survey, Fear not, we will have other surveys coming out as we always like to improve and get feedback. Um, the other way you can actually pick up allow lists uh, is that we have our application out there for you know guests on numbers therapy. And so we provide, we provide allow lists to both guests as well as people who nominate a guest if they wind up being a guest on the show too. So that's the second way and that's floating around. Uh, Poop or myself or uh, another person on the staff can direct you to that form if you'd like to fill it too. Um, we do continue to want to have your feedback or thoughts. So if you just have a one-off thought or way to improve our show or, or an idea, you know, please feel free to pass it across. We want to make sure it's, it's really awesome and valuable for everybody. And then lastly, you know, check us out on Apple, Spotify, and Google podcasts. We're in all those places. You can catch any episodes you may have missed and ensure also to grab the continuity and order that we're really intentionally building in. So with that in mind, for framing purposes, the purpose of numbers therapy, of course, is to talk to the macro and bring on and showcase our experts in here. The goals more specifically are so that everyone can understand how the big pieces fit together, make better decisions with NFTs and other investments using a balanced perspective, learn about or from some of our people in here and get different perspectives, and then learn about different areas and opportunities that exist out there as well and different ways of thinking. So I always say as a reminder, as anybody who's listened live knows, there are different levels in here listening live, even, of course, listening to, to the podcast that's recorded uh, in the other channels. It's really important that everyone is along for the ride all the way through the episode. So if, if you have any questions, even if they're very, very simple questions, uh, you know, a definition, an acronym or something else, you know, please feel free to drop it into guest questions. That's a perk of being able to listen live, of course. Uh, and equally, if you have an intermediate or advanced question, drop it in there also. And, you know, we'll try to answer it, of course, and I'll try to weave it in along the way or, or put it at the appropriate place. Lastly, important note and disclaimer, none of what you hear and hear is financial advice. It's all opinions. So without further ado, and on to today's guest and episode. Today's guest, many in MBHQ have grown to know well. He's just a really, really good dude. And from my vantage point, I've seen him go from a bit under the radar to super savvy and vocal and super helpful, as many of us have experienced in, in a short time. He's become a resident expert, certainly in all things Yuga, and has another unconventional pre-NFT background in becoming an expert in these projects, and yet has just zoomed in, in his sophistication of tokenomics, project detail, timing, a variety of other things. I personally always love hearing his takes, and today we'll get into his approach and how he spends time, his due diligence process, and beyond. Equally importantly, you know, currently with, with the macro markets at their current, let's call it sitting point, it's a perfect time to talk about the main NFT projects out there, their tiering, and more importantly, the, the viability he sees for each of these projects moving forward. And I think it will be a great frame for all projects. But this will no doubt lead us to math and numbers today, and I'm definitely excited to tear this apart in debate. I'm additionally, super happy to have him as a friend. Even got to share some pretty epic Quavo stage seats with him in NFTLA. Look forward to hopefully doing similar this year. With that said, please welcome Cough Drop to the stage, everyone. Cough, how's it going today, man? Great, great. Thank you for the wonderful uh, intro there. Uh, that was spectacular. And I want to congratulate you for the 26th episode. Um, 
I remember when numbers therapy just started uh, out the blue, I guess, 26 weeks ago, and it's been a hit ever since. I've learned a lot from it, and it's helped me, I'd say, take a more realistic approach to uh, not just trading, but looking at markets as a whole. And I don't think uh, if I didn't have the numbers therapy podcast and office hours that I would have, uh, I probably would have been holding all my ETH all the way down if I didn't hear you guys uh, uh, have a, you know, unique mindset uh, to the bearish market. So thank you for having me on. I'm really honored and excited to talk about uh, some fun NFT projects today. Yeah, thanks for saying that, Kof. And and for context, the hope was that therapy would not last this long. But as we know, we're in a bull, in a bear market still, and frankly, even in a bull market, sometimes we do therapy. So I guess on we go. Um, so first things first, let's maybe start with some background, as we as we usually do. Before NFTs became NFTs, what were you doing before all of this? You know, whatever you feel comfortable sharing. So. I will say I'm about two years out of college now. And uh, for the past two years, I've been doing supply chain management and operations. Uh, If you live in the Washington, D.C., Maryland, Virginia, the DMV area, and you buy a certain brand of coffee at Walmart, Target, uh, wherever it may be, I probably ordered it and uh, had it placed on that shelf. So that was really fun. I've always been into numbers. executing things, getting things done. Um, But even before that, I was what some people may uh, hate in this market, but I was a bit of a sneaker kid uh, before that, uh, where I kind of learned that there is more depth of value to items, um, such as paying $2,000 for a sneaker uh, gives you a little bit of... uh, I don't know. It gives you more of an ability to pay $2,000 for an NFT. So that kind of brought me into this market. But um, supply chain management and operations was pretty much my thing. So that was fun. Yeah, so supply chain operations and management, obviously the the exact background one would expect to go into NFTs. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the funny thing is about the other part of what you said is, you know, is the only difference between us and other people is that, we can see that people are willing to pay for things like this, right? It, whereas, like the normies can't get their head around the fact why somebody would pay two grand for a, pet, uh, a set of kicks or an NFT or whatever. Is, is that maybe the difference at the end of the day? And, and we're not that much different otherwise. I don't know. Yeah, one hundred percent. Because it's crazy to think somebody can pay that until they pay it, and then you flip the switch. Uh, so. To all the NFT naysayers, uh, it was insane to see people paying $10,000 for a monkey until the monkeys were $50,000. Then it's like, oh, I'll pay $10,000. So it's just being ahead of that curve um, and really putting your conviction out there and taking that risk. Uh, Funny funny anecdote about that is, as I have like my normie friends that blast me in our WhatsApp groups and whatever else... The response to them that I always gave and why why I was able to always mentally be comfortable is I kind of said all assets are kind of stupid at the end of the day, right? Like diamonds are stupid, gold is stupid. It, it all doesn't make sense. It's all kind of irrational to some extent, right? So why is this why you know, why is this necessarily any different? And at least then they, they can like kind of get their head around something like it, but who knows? I'm not gonna fight that battle anymore with them, uh, at least for the time being. So, okay. So with that as the back th- background and backdrop, how did you enter the NFT space? What got you started in this space? What was the initial project you touched? How did you hear about it? So I mentioned I fooled around with sneakers a bit. Mostly that was, I'd say, uh, my high school um, days I did that. But going into college, I needed... Um, you know, some more money. I I bought the top of the 2017 crypto bubble and lost almost all of my disposable income. I was down about 90% for three years and I held it all. So I thought I was the smartest kid in the world and I thought I would get rich, Um, but it didn't happen. So uh, when I was down so much, I looked for other ways um, to make income because I was only working internships. So 
I reverted back to the sneaker market and what was hot during COVID times uh, with supply chain issues was selling uh, limited items out of Walmarts or uh, out of Targets or going online and getting drops. I was big into the baseball cards, basketball cards. So I operated through Discords and actually met Grape Dutch pretty early. Um, I'd say like two or three years ago through a Discord because he is a legend with uh, flipping these household items. So that kind of led me down the uh, path of Discord where just open doors uh, to what can we sell? Is it a baseball card? Is it a uh, digital collectible? Like what's next? So I just kind of fell into NFTs in January of 2021. I bought my first NFT off Nifty Gateway. It was Dot Pigeon. He's an artist. I don't know if anybody knows him here, but he makes some cool art. Yeah, I was in, I was in uh, RC, Usus, uh, however, Jesus, however you say it, we've met. So still in there. I don't know. I got in a fight with RC. So, uh, but uh, Jesus is referring to a reselling group that was extremely popular back in the day. So what I would do is I transitioned to NFTs through Nifty Gateway and had some issues with it as I lost a lot of money uh, when I realized that these uh, high value art NFTs don't really have any liquidity. Um, so I basically did not purchase any NFTs from February of 2021 until July of 2021 and decided to go back at it with 0.2 ETH in my wallet. Might have been 0.1, maybe 0.15. And uh, I bought a couple Alpha Betties. Uh, I bought a couple Lucha Libres, flipped a couple things, uh, <laughs> got to an Ether Lambo. And this is where it gets uh, a little funny here, but the Ether Lambos were a historical NFT project, which started um, being rediscovered uh, when we were in that Ether Rock phase. I purchased one for 1.7 ETH, the Vitalik uh, version. It was all the money I had from flipping. And uh, immediately after, there was an exploit where you could mint like double the supply of everything. So it went down to like 0.6 ETH, and I thought I was doomed. I thought NFTs were dead for good. But about a week later, the price steadily rose, and I <laughs> okay, Jinza. But I so I ended up selling it for 8.4 ETH about uh, a week or two later. Um, and it was pretty much game from there. It was NFTs were it. That's awesome. That's awesome. I mean, per, per your flipping comments too, we've heard the stories about inflatable hot tubs also. So I know that's come up at least a couple of times too, at least great talking about those. So, so you came into this then with your lens on, fr from a flipping standpoint, right? It, it's short term transactional flipping. That's kind of, that kind of was your thought process, right? So you were not thinking like, even midterm horizon and investing, you were just thinking, how could I get in and very tight time horizons, right? 100%. I did not think the space had too much longevity. Um, coming into it, it was 100% focused on short term flipping, uh, making profit and staying as liquid as possible. Yeah, out of curiosity, not to get ahead here, but has, has your mindset shifted at all? Like if, if, if you say, if it's a hundred percent to make up, are you still a hundred percent flipper? Are you now like 80% flipper, 20% investor, like midterm? Like where's your mindset currently out of curiosity? That's a great question. Um, I still have the flipper in me. I will always be a profit maxi flipper, but as I've kind of matured in the space and that what we'll talk about later a bit is I pay a lot more attention to art now. And I'm trying to uh, kind of mold my long-term portfolio in my vault to mostly art, if possible, um, because we all know how hard it is for a PFP collection to deliver a constant value to their holders. So it's it's just, I think art is really where it's at uh, for if you're going to long-term hold. So I like to keep a lot of USTC compared to other coins but 
as you know, I'll be in and out of ApeCoin and ETH. I don't really touch anything else. Um, but I definitely do love NFTs and think they will survive for many, many years. But I'm bearish on pretty much everything besides art currently that's interesting it's kind of i mean again not to get ahead but it's kind of like the same situation we saw with punks to some extent right where all these projects are trying to innovate maybe innovate too much in many cases right where they don't have like the operational capability to be able to pull it off in many cases plus it's new it's very very challenging and punks are just sitting there in the background not doing anything right like not not doing much very 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 innovative and as a result of that, like over time, they just became more valuable, right? Because they didn't mess things up operationally, whereas almost every other project had some issue that they ran into. It's, it's almost art-like, you know? Exactly. But um, I have, a, I have a little sneaking suspicion that uh, punks may do something soon. Maybe Art Basel, but we'll see. Okay, that sounds like more than a sneaking suspicion, so we'll definitely have to get into that <laughs> soon. So, Maybe. All right. Perfect transition then. So let's ask the obvious question before we start delving into the projects. So first off, what is your favorite project in coin and why is it apes and ape coin? <laughs> yeah, so I mean I'm not shy about it. People know that I am a Yuga Maxi. Uh I've been extremely upset with the communication regarding ape coin staking. Um uh to address the comment by King Wizard, yes, Papa is my alt account, but we won't get into that. But back to ApeCoin, um, basically, I saw a trend in November to about February of 2021 to 2022, where it was the race to the metaverse, where all these companies, all these projects we're really trying to take the investment that the NFT market had ready to spend uh, on a project and pour it all into some form of metaverse project. So when the other side launched, uh, whether we could call it a successful launch or not, uh, most likely the latter, the successful part about it was they did raise a boatload of money and a lot of people have just tons and tons of investment dug into it. Um, I believe they won the race to the metaverse uh, by doing that and their competitor uh, would be really Facebook or Apple at this point because they own this web3 native metaverse where i do believe it will be interoperable as they claim and others will build on top of it so i really do believe that the ape coin will be very useful um with whatever's built in the other side uh metaverse for the next five ten years because everything's going to be powered by it. So it sounds a little crazy, but I do think it's a top 10 coin because all these NFT projects are going to fall back and try and tag up with the apes and I think build into their um, other side. And that's why I've been so bullish on it all this time. That makes sense. Uh, that makes total sense. All right. So Everybody listening live, or even if you're listening recorded, be uh, get prepared to be a little bit heated because now we're gonna delve in a little bit to things that I don't know. Not everyone's gonna agree on it. Everyone's gonna have their own thoughts or rankings or structure or anything else. Um, so this should be pretty fun. So let's get into the real foundation here. What are the top tier projects in your mind, or what are your top tier projects? How would you group them? I think I think that you know probably the top tier projects are probably not going to differ for most people, but more importantly, how would you group them and how are you thinking about them, Kaf? All right, so great question. My top tier. This is looking as big picture stepping back. This is not. Um, I'm not answering the question of oh, what should I buy? What is the top tier projects to buy this month and sell next month for profit? No, I'm looking at the one to two year outlook, what companies, uh, projects, companies are going to take that next step to really build a national uh, 
worldwide brand that's recognizable to not just people who are on Discord 24-7. So I separated um, my first, my tier, I'll give it now. So I did do the other side and the board apes uh, together. And then my next one was punks and me bits. And I separated them from other side and board apes. And you'll hear why in a bit. Next, clone X and their ecosystem. And then finally in the top tier, art blocks. Get prepared for the tomatoes to be thrown at you, by the way. I'm just I'm just really warning you. We're about to have chat blow up today. People ang exactly. It's coming already. So <laughs> whether it's live or otherwise, but keep, keep on going. <laughs> yeah, so so that is my only um top tier projects from a realistic outlook where I think they have a high probability chance to uh capture a non-web three based market share. I just talked a little bit about other sides, uh other side. So I'll start before I loop back to them with Clone X because we have a very prevalent um example that happened today with the Ramoa, if if that's how you say it, uh, the Ramoa drop that they did. Um, it's clear that CloneX is taking what we call a digital approach, blending physical items and digital collectibles with burning for claims, um, etc. They're trying to bring the fashion world into the Web3 industry. And it's reminding me a lot of the rollout with the Nike sneakers app. Um, if anybody understands that comparison, basically Nike has an app where you there there will be a shoe release, say at 1 p.m. Eastern, and everybody gets on the app, clicks and gets in the queue, and then the lucky 5,000 are able to purchase that shoe. Um, I believe that this is Nike's goal with Clonex to build their own version of the Nike sneakers app, but for Web3 collectibles that you can claim physicals with. And then hopefully one day for Clonex, it will it'll just be uh, Web3 collectibles and NFTs that they could sell off. So th this is how they're going to come to the mass market by creating artificial scarcity uh, like we saw with this Ramoa drop with only 2,000 or so NFTs at a pretty attractive price point and selling them off. So Clonex is a ticking time bomb. If Nike pays more attention to it, I don't see any way that it can't really compete with Bored Apes, uh, to be honest. Because By the way, by, by the way Kyle, given the fact that we're on Clonex and Nike at this point, it's probably worth talking about Adidas for a second too, right? Because they're also not limited by digital as well, like you're talking about. They've done some of that already. Obviously, Nike is a bigger brand, carries more pop than than Adidas. But does that, by default, make Adidas like a, a tier B? Let's say. I would say it's a um, it's a sleeper. It's like what do they call it in March Madness? It's a dark horse because they really haven't rolled anything out. So they have established. Um, some form of partnership with Yuga Labs, which we are unsure of, but their Into the Metaverse NFT has really not been rolled out yet. We had that one clothing claim um, a while ago, but <laughs> but I'm reading some of these comments are funny, but um, we had the one clothing claim a while ago, but they rumored avatars that just haven't happened. So that is a good Dark Horse sleeper um to mention for sure yeah yeah okay so we'll call it a sleeper he's just saying that that you're saying it's an nit team i see the parallel <laughs> yeah. along your fidgeta line it, it could just be but yeah keep going I, I know you wanted to talk about punks and me bits for instance and how you're thinking about those yeah definitely keep yeah keep yeah so we'll get into the punks and me bits so um i may have or we all definitely saw the Tiffany collab uh, that kind of set the tone for punks. That was their, if I'm not mistaken, their first major um, collaboration with any brand. Um, 
since joining Yuga. So I think there's more to come on that sphere of high fashion, but they definitely have the biggest assets for punk by f- for punks by far is the fact that they do not need to add constant utility for the holders. So you don't want to say, here's an example. You don't want to add the punks or the me bits to the ape coin staking program, because that's going to ruin uh, their value, tying them to a token price. Punks are such a historic piece kind of reminding me the most similar NFT to the punk in my eyes is the Chromie squiggle. Um, which is a very, very blue chip. I'll get into that in a minute too. We've seen them going up. But I think small luxury fashion collaborations can maintain that status symbol of punks being special and different. And that could also get more uh, celebrities to notice the punks like we saw the run with Jay-Z, Beyonce, Odell Beckham, you name it. Uh, last year when they were all buying them so punks and me bits they need to just be it's like it's like a um it's like a good cat you know it's like you don't really feed it too often you don't really bother it too much you just kind of let it do its thing and it's just like it's there and it's just hanging out it's like a really good pet so so uh, i did see that ruthless odell sold his punk and he shouted out Sobi, and that was really interesting but that's another example of nike starting to market to their athletes um, but beyond the punks and me scale the one that i mentioned in this top tier that may have surprised some people was the art blocks um so like i mentioned beforehand um i do believe in the power of art um for nfts uh similar to what i just explained with the punks you do not need to add utility you do not need to add value uh the main issue with art is just controlling the supply and building a brand image for the artist or the collection itself um so we've seen uh some really great artists come out of the web3 space through artblocks curated collections that we probably never i'm not saying we but i probably never would have heard of so People like Emily Chi, if that's how you say her name. Um, Papa uh, turned me on to her a bunch. I really love her Memories collection. Um, other collections like Meridians. I really think these are going to age well, especially with the cutoff that we saw with uh, the curated series ending, or at least uh, for now, the one through eight is solidified. So. I think art is very special because it holds its value and it has a different type of holders compared to a PFP collection. So I don't, I'm always going to be looking at art blocks, stacking art blocks, trying to, uh, trying to grow my portfolio and find art. And that's why I consider them uh, forever top tier. And one more thing before I throw it back to you, Aslo, but uh, the MoMA investment, I know it's a bit of a buzzword right now, but I did sit through about a three hour video of the MoMA doing a presentation for uh, some of their colleagues that released, I think, this past week, maybe a week ago. Um, but there were some interesting things in there, and they are exploring uh art blocks and they are exploring more digital collections i know uh someone who has close ties to mvhq of course i'm gonna forget the name on the spot if somebody could help me on the uh in the chat but the famous artist who did the soho house panel with mvhq uh they talked about him a lot yes jake thank you rafiq anadol close ties to mvhq shout out and they talked about him a lot. So, I mean, it'd be hard to fade art at this point. Yeah. So MoMA, by the way, in case anybody not familiar, Museum of Modern Art. Um, so the logical IRL place, if anywhere, that would actually capture it. But that's pretty cool to hear. You do have questions firing in already. Um, questions are a good sign, by the way, because they're not just angry disagreements, although we'll probably get some of those too. But we definitely have questions coming in. While we're on this tier, at least, 
Uh, Sneaky's asking about Nike and Clonex, right? And I think the concern here is Nike's attention on Clonex and also gating it as the pathway to exclusive drops in, in, in that direction. I think the question is, like, if that's not the only path that they have for exclusive drops, for instance, right? Is that a risk that exists here? You know, is Nike's attention on Clonex a risk that exists here, for instance, if they have another drop path? 100% it's a risk. Um, the, it's, it, it's the only, the only reason Nike's in this number one category is because, or Clonex is in this number one category to me is because of that Nike affiliation. Um, without that, I mean, they would be <laughs> way lower, but when you think about the investment that, Nike has made and they want to keep their core web three audience. Um, the upside of them really leveraging the clone X collection is massive enough to keep it in this category, but for sure it's the most, most risky, uh, out of all of these. If I had to assign a, um, this is an interesting comparison. Now, if I had to assign a, crypto to each of these tier uh projects i would say art blocks is a bitcoin uh maybe not the highest uh you know moon value you know maybe not the highest ceiling but it's very steady very safe yugo would be like an eth it's very cool very trendy but also very new very uh malleable and clone x is like a solana so we could see a huge huge ceiling uh but also there is major risk uh that if nike does go in a different direction like sneaky said i mean the project is pretty much toast uh from there if they lose focus for it so that's a great point it's another question that's coming into this tier is about your thought process on art and so what i'm getting from what you're saying is that more about the project in this case, and that's the primary deciding factor as to, as to hold art, right? So your play is on art blocks in general, right? Is there something else that leads you? So for instance, within art blocks, how are you kind of making your picks within there as an example, or, or even outside of art blocks? So I try and stay to more, if I'm going to buy any art, I try and stay to the most established uh, collections and not really buy for moonshots. So things that have stood the test of time um i really like and that test of time may be three months six months but uh gauging the collections in a great group it's gated is grailer's dow um but also if you just talk uh in the art blocks i know i see a lot of mvhq people in the art blocks discord um i won't i won't lie and tell you that i buy uh, low uh, non-popular artists' artworks and hold them because I support a lot of artists. I mostly just buy things that the artists have the biggest social following, interact with their audience often because that's extremely important to me, and uh, they know how to control their supply. So uh, even though it's not an art box, that's why I was um, so into the Tyler Hobbs and Dandelion Whist QQL project. Um, because I know Tyler Hobbs is very conscious of the supply of what artwork he is giving to his consumers. Um, and we all know he has the huge name from the Fidenza collection and uh, incomplete control. So it's definitely important to have those three factors with the artists interacting with the community to maintain their brand image. Uh, the history of some volume on the collections, and then them not oversupplying their artwork. So those are the three things I, I looked for. Yeah. We talked some numbers here, by the way, before we move on to the next tier. Um, I know you gave the the parallels to to the different different tokens, right, or different coins. Um, what numbers are we talking here? What what do you think is the upside for each of these projects? And you can use whatever time horizon you feel comfortable with. But like, what do you think the path forward is? You know, we know that all these projects have a limited quantity, right? Obviously, now it feels like kind of limited quantity, but the future is, you know, presumably like hundreds of thousands, millions of people are are in the space. 
What do you, what do you think the ceiling is for these in the pathway forward? I think the highest short-term ceiling short-term being a year outlook would be the clone X. Um, for sure. I could see it. Like I said, people may have been taken back when I said they could compete with apes, but it wouldn't shock me to see Clonax at 40 ETH if Nike really gets moving with um, uh, with their valuation. If If the Artifact team can prove that they have a reliable system to make drops uh, weekly uh, or bi-weekly, which could generate a lot of uh, revenue without too much cost um, just by these nfts and nike can just start dropping things on their gigantic consumer base and clone x get some priority advantage i mean it could be uh i i wouldn't i wouldn't be shocked to see 40 eth in a year but at the same time that what sneaky said if they don't uh, if they abandon that and don't give priority access then it's not great, as they say. Uh, with Yuga, I believe there is upside. I do think apes and mutants are un- are overvalued a bit. Short term, I would probably say they have a little room to run going into staking because people still don't realize how big that program is, especially the Q1 of staking. Pretty much everyone's going to get at least uh, 70% return uh, in ape coin. If if you stake the max allotment with your Yuga NFT, um, so the sky is the limit for Yuga. But uh, realistically, I think it's going to be more spreading out into uh, new drops. They need to time their collections right if they're going to do anything else. Um, and I think more of a focus, even though they're supposed to be separated, Board API Club and other side and all that. I think more of the focus is on other side right now and that Yuga will be taking mostly a social approach, uh, probably building some form of event space in Miami. So I don't think the upside is too high on them unless it's through other side airdrops and such. Um, punks and me bits, punks upside is huge uh, to become a fashion iconic symbol. Uh, I mean, they get, they had a run at it this past year. Um, but if they can maintain that really, you know, premier status, uh, I think they hired a great person in Noah Davis. I talked to him a bunch and, um, he understands, you know, he knows his job's going to be a little bit of a babysitter, um, because we know the punk community, uh, they're protective as they should be, you know, they don't want, like I said, they don't want to be included in the ape coin airdrop. They don't want to be blah, blah, blah. Uh, it needs to be a protected asset. And I think Noah Davis is a great steward, um, for them. So, uh, me bits are weird. I hope they don't, I heard a rumor about them doing interchangeable trades. I pray that's not true because that will ruin so much value. I think Yuga's smart enough not to let people customize them, but they'll probably be customizable in like the other side metaverse if, if, if they're customizable at all. But I think there's a bit of a lower ceiling on them because that was more of a, a little grab by (laughs) Larva labs back in the day. Uh, And with art blocks, uh, we do have a suspicion of what, is to come you know there's been an insane amount of hype with seed phrase danny secure is the wallet buying up a full set in the past uh i think it was two days ago maybe so he spent like 700 eth or something so we hear momo rumors we hear a lot i think there's a lot of side uh a lot of upside short term with our blocks but overall i don't think the um the numbers will change that much. I think they're at a pretty fair price uh, to slowly accumulate over time. I don't think we're seeing any three to five X's out of main art blocks collections anytime soon. So that's why I gave them the Bitcoin comparison. 
That makes sense. That make, that makes total sense. All right. So with that foundation in mind, let's move down to the dare I say B tier. I don't want to say B tier. It's going to trigger some people. I feel like let's move down to the next tier. How about that? What's in your next tier, and how do you think about them? Okay, here's my next tier. Um, there are four projects in this tier: Doodles, as we all know, Azuki, making a comeback. Moonbirds, believe it or not, and the little bit of a surprise, Digi Daigaku coming in. So the second, this is not an order either, um, but it's just the tier grouping. Doodles, Azuki, Moonbirds, and Digi Daigaku, if that's how you say it. Okay, so break it apart for us. Why? Why do you think they're in this category? Why? You know, how do you dissect each of these projects? I mean, how do you think about it? So, what changes these projects from the top tier is, I believe they're a lot of hype based, and they haven't done anything or have any really fully established partners to be able to make that jump into what I call the blue chip territory in the first tier. So there is still a chance that these projects die out almost completely over the next two to three years. So that's why they're included here. But the good side, they also have definite, definite room to solidify themselves over the next year and run up and be included in that upper echelon of NFTs. Um, to get into it, I could go into Doodles. That's a fun one, if you like. Let's do it. Yeah, so Doodles, as we all know, um, they're trying a mass market approach of the Doodles 2, which we assume is going to be a free mint. Um, quick history of Doodles. They never really opted to do a second launch. Uh during the full bull market, they waited until the Genesis boxes. So if you held a doodle since mint, you were able to, I don't know if you could call it a claim, but you were able to swap your doodle for a space doodle, which was a little animation and the team uh, raised zero dollars off that. And then you were airdropped a duplicator, which has had no use um, and took about I don't know, 90 days to reveal. And then they did a uh, max extraction Dutch auction um, for their Genesis boxes. Um, so clearly, I mean, I guess from my tone, you could tell I'm not the biggest Doodle fan. Um, I respect their team and not fully cash grabbing with a secondary collection in the main bowl. They could have easily pulled in, I don't know, 10, 20 million dollars with a big collection. But what I do respect with the team is they know how to build a brand from what I've seen and who I talk to. And I really think they will be successful doing it. The art, uh, except for some floors, which you could say for almost every collection besides Azuki, um, some of the floors are terrible, but their rares look great. The artist is great. They're well connected and they're well-funded now doing a couple rounds um, and after the Genesis Mint. So I really think it's going to be tough to return value back to holders. But if you look at them as a brand standpoint, they're in a pretty great place. Um, they have Pharrell Williams on board uh, in some role we don't know yet. Uh, and they're trying to make this Doodles 2 free mint where you could customize your own uh, avatar in some way uh, they rumored making a game maybe integrating the space doodles um, that's all great and I think that it probably will be pretty popular they did have a collaboration um, or burnt toasted uh, with Google for mental health awareness week if you didn't see uh, burnt toast did some NFTs for them but I just don't see the value getting back. The average Genesis box minter paid about $600 USD. And say that gets broken up into six uh, wearable NFTs for your uh, doodles too. How are you going to recoup the cost? Uh, rumored ETH uh, 
ETH track, they call it, um, value add with the duplicator besides copying your own traits and selling it to duels to people. I think there's just too much money invested. And if they are successful and add normies uh, into the doodles two uh, project, I don't think they're paying $80 for a t-shirt. So that's why I have a little issue. Their cost basis for users is a bit too high. Yeah, that makes sense. On the, on the pro side, of course, if you contrast them versus some of the others in your cat in, in this category, or at least a couple of the others, like you said, a $54 million web ch uh, or, or chest that they that they raised recently, I think in September, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so they've got a war chest sitting there too, right? So they're they're semi-protected and you have you know a whole batch of people who are motivated to, to drive it forward. Whereas I don't believe Azuki and G Moonbirds to some extent, but um, Azuki and Digi have as much capital, right? Yep, yep. Yeah, it, it's just tough because the thing I just can't get over is, like, if you hit it out of the ballpark and you add, let's say, 500,000 users to Doodles 2, and it's a massive success, um, I just still don't think any OG holder is recouping their investment uh, with Genesis boxes or using the duplicator to sell traits of their own doodle because those are going to be the most rare uh, pieces to sell. Uh, the duplicator is you literally say you have a coffee head doodle, you use the duplicator, you copy your trait, and you sell it on the doodles to market. And I don't know, like, well, people aren't going to pay $200 for a coffee head. Like, it just doesn't make sense. But I think they'll build a great brand. So. They have, they definitely. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. Cough. Go ahead. No, I was just saying they definitely have a lot of upside uh, with the brand. And if they could somehow figure out how to return value to those box and duplicator whales, then, then it's all sunny from there. Yeah. yeah I mean, it kind of comes back to your clone X comments and Nike, right? I mean, Nike has that brand and brand reputation already, right? So everyone wants their kicks. Everyone wants their other stuff. The bet, of course, is can Doodles head in that direction? Can Azuki head in that direction and be that coveted, right? And if that's the case and there is a digital crossover, and, and you know, maybe it's possible. Who knows? Um, okay. And what what about the others in this in this tier would you take off? About, what about Azuki? Because I know Azuki's on everyone's minds here. Did we get rugged? Get rugged by cough. Rugged by cough. Okay. Speechless. Speechless about now. Zuki. No comment officially yes. answered. Yeah. Yeah, we got now. You. Okay, I just joined back, so my bad. But um, getting into a Zuki, um. Yeah, so I was heartbroken by them uh, when the Zagabond info came out. But talking to people who actually build in the space, um, they're much more apologetic. So I've learned to not hold a grudge. And, you know, if the market's saying something, I am a profit maxi. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to forgive this guy for the sake of my bags for now. So they're doing a great job with the project. I suspect the bean token to be coming soon. Uh, there's no alpha on that. I just, if I had to make a bet, I would say we get the bean token before Christmas uh, for sure. But um, no alpha, just like, I'm serious. That's just a guess. But um, it makes sense. It makes sense. They're raising money. Um, they want to lock in a lot of funds. They're doing deep lore and storytelling, going into the garden. You have to take a bean to go into the garden. I was saying some of this to Papa, and he said something in the Azuki chat uh, today, but you take a bean and go into the garden, and then you, I don't know, you meet Bobu, and you play with your beans. That sounds weird, but you uh, you find these mystical creatures in the forest. So that's what I assume it's going to be. It's going to be a collection of toads, frogs, cats, all the traits, and then the rare dragons. So my guess is you pay a bean token to venture into the forest and your Azuki looks for 
these rare creatures and but that's a lot of speculation now uh that we don't need to get into so that's more fun you could catch me in the zuki chat talking about that but what we do know is they have an extremely strong grasp on the asian american market and uh from what i could tell the asian market too and zagabon's done amazing job networking uh doing that art exhibit in hong kong uh a week back the skateboard auction was excellent um so they're really making a lot of right moves developing this luxury streetwear brand and a big reason why i was on bullish on them until the news was the fact that they are the underground really web three culture brand so yuga's a bit you know corporate and everything but azuki really does you know they have their cult community but they really are about web three ideals so that's why i could see them moving up into that top tier soon possibly so, so a common thread that's kind of coming through in the live discussion is the potential hold on the bean token until the you know the yuga sec conversation is happening so i guess the question there is does azuki have a pathway if they were to not release or be able to release a bean token for instance do you think they have a positive path forward without the token Oh, for sure. Yeah, I just think of it because it, it kind of makes sense. And I don't think they're going to release a collection right now. Um, I also don't think that the Yuga and SEC thing ties into Zuki at all. I think it's more just a comparison um, with, you know, funks to punks versus, uh, you know, rider rips apes versus regular apes. So I don't really think that matters that much. But they 100% have a path, um, and they're showing it right now. I mean, they've pretty much doubled over the past month, maybe two months, and um, people are getting back on board. There's a lot of liquidity left out of the market that said they would never buy Azuki again, aka uh, people like me, and that are getting interested again. So they definitely have some room to run Bean Token or not, for sure. And what specifically is getting you interested again? Is it just that the community is really solid and you're recognizing that even through these challenges, the community is still solid? Like, what's getting you well, interested? I can't stand the community, if we're being honest. I can't stand the Azuki Maxis. They're so annoying. But uh, that's just them being total moon boys. But it's the execution of Zagabond. And it's the fact that this is a web three brand you know this is the most web three of web three it's the underground like board robot said they're the skaters of the internet uh the art is spectacular that's something we all admire like you can't you can't hate the art it's not like you have to be a fan of anime it's just beautiful art like they crush it out the park and the execution has been there uh it's just it's just a really good project when you compare it to others. Zagamon knows what he's doing. He's well connected. And I could hold a grudge against him and I could push it aside and say that he's going to take this thing uh, to the top tier. And it may as well be true. So, oh, a question related to Azuki that's coming in live as well is what do you think the emblems will do for holders? And he says they elevated mid, mid rares within the collection and can go a few directions here. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah. So the emblems, I mean, another great idea by them. Uh, it incentivizes uh, accumulation. And like Robot said, mid rares were getting snatched up. Finally, we see a bit of a difference between the blue and red Azukis. Uh, I've always loved those. I don't know why they never got the love that they deserved in my eyes. Um, but I guess moving to the PBT uh, token, I guess you can um, maybe have more access for things depending on the amount of, uh, you know, badges you have and keep hinting at it. So I definitely think the skateboard token, the, everybody who completed their collection, it's going to turn into some uh, form of 
mega mutant ape type thing. There's no shot that these people were paying 300 ETH and uh, don't have a uh, assumption that they may get heavily rewarded by having the full set of tokens. So, yeah. So let's get to the the other obvious one within here. So Digi, why why are you placing Digi within this tier too? I think that would be a surprise for most people. Um, what are your what are your thoughts there? Yeah, so Digi's really burst on the scene as we all know, and we we're talking about the Doodles War Chest of fifty four million. Um, Digi's got around two hundred. Uh, we all know they're making a big splash. Uh, with the 200 or with the seven million dollar Super Bowl ad, and they're trying to enter the mobile gaming industry, which you know, agree with Gabe Laydon or not, he does have experience uh building, and if he's able to tap into that mobile gaming industry and somehow make this into some form of you know successful. Uh, game and reach that mass market, uh, then they are easily at the top tier. Um, in I'm a Tribe Diamond holder, and the founder of Tribe Diamonds, Nick, was giving some really good insight about Digi, and he's saying that, like, his company is just trying to, you know, focus on the Web three space right now. Um, Gabe is going to hit a home run or nothing else. He's going to bridge uh, Web3 to mass market or he's going to fail. Um, so that's why I put him in here for now because it really is, I don't know how he's going to keep delivering value to holders, but he does have a chance with all that money and all his experience marketing, advertising, uh, to grow that brand and build that bridge to uh, the web to mobile gaming industry. So this is, it's one of my favorite projects to watch, even though I don't have too much of a clear viewpoint on where it may go. I don't know if, even if he does hit a home run, how much value it translates to, um, for sure through airdrops, but it's, it is the most fun project to watch right now in my eyes. And I mean, speaking of war chests, they're like mega war chests that they have too. I mean, they've got yeah. several hundred million at this point, so that makes sense. What is remaining, Kof? What uh, beyond this tier? How many? What are your other main tiers? Do you have one more main tier? A couple more yeah, main tiers? Yeah, those, those are thicker ones because they're they're basic and they're similar. But we'll end this tier uh, with the infamous project Moonbirds. Yes, Ezrin, you didn't miss it. So. Uh, Moonbirds, as we know, I had a little complicated relationship with this project. Um, not the biggest fan of the demeanor of the team, and I showcased that more than once. But I do like what they're doing with uh, Proof. So I'll talk about Proof quickly as they laid it out in the Proof of Conference. If you haven't dove into that, I highly recommend it. Um, they are basically transitioning to an art blocks 2.0 uh, style of they're going to be an in-house art distribution, uh, very complicated, exactly six mil. It's going to be basically in-house art distribution where they bring in artists, create NFTs, and I guess sell them. So I love it. I love the idea. I respect Kevin Rose and his art um, side. But for a 40 ETH pass, I do not think it's going to translate to value. Uh, for a proof pass, I find it very hard for them to retain that. Um, with that being said, Moonbirds is going to give you access to find a mythic. A Moonbirds mythic is the new collection, which is estimated at 25... Uh, you know, 25 are found a day. So the collection should mint out. I believe it was a little under two years. Um, very interesting formula. You also could burn oddities for a chance at it. I just think they revealed a bit too much. I mean, I don't, I don't hate the project. I just think it was overvalued. And what they're trying to give you at this rate, I they laid out way too many details that 
they have to execute so perfectly. There's so much pressure on this team because of people like me who are haters. I've transitioned out of my hater arc now, but they have so many haters that will nitpick every detail that they did wrong. And moving on to what Scotto said, thoughts on the proof token. Um, Project High Rise, the big, the big buzzword that was propelling this project from 2.5 to 40 ETH in a week and a half looks like a glorified MySpace page. Like, it's cool, and I probably would use it, but you got DECA, you got Twitter. I mean, if all it is is just to showcase your art in a nice way and maybe set a status or two, and they did mention you need to use, like, a uh, uh, quote unquote, I think Justin Mezel said, a proposed use case of proof token will be upgrading your high rise profile and blah, blah, blah. What value is that going to give me? I mean, if they could somehow uh, utilize the proof token to only mint uh, the proof art collections, I mean, that gives it some value, but. At that rate, I mean, it just gets complicated at that point. So they have a lot of money. They have probably more connections than almost anyone uh, not named Yuga. I'm looking at the list. Uh, so I don't doubt them. But if they adhere to the plan and don't have anything to really ruffle feathers, that was, that was a joke. But um, I don't know how it really retains its value. I mean, news is is that we're hearing that, but there's you know there's time, there's building time still, and 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 certainly the war chest and connections, like you said. But there you go. We said we're going to have some uh, opinions in here <laughs> that some may disagree with uh, or agree with. But let's keep it running. Um, thanks for catching the moonbirds, by the way, Kof. I, pre- I appreciate it. Um, of course. Let's move it on to the next category. So you want to lay the foundation for the next category or categories you have? Yeah, so the next tier is um, projects that, that, you know, they're solid projects, um, but their mass approach is different in the fact that they're not trying to build an empire. They're more focused, they're more niche. um, And you'll see the niche I'm talking about. These projects are pudgy penguins, cool cats, and I'll add chimpers too to the list i'll touch on them too so these projects are mostly focused on driving ip they're very art driven and uh they're not gonna try and rule the world like some of the other ones we mentioned they are much more focused and uh are trying to you know just carve out their niche in their uh respective fields that makes that makes complete sense. So, given that you're positioning it as as niche, right? I mean, what what do the prospects of these projects look like? Because I mean, no shortage, no shortage of of little speed bumps that we had along the way with at least a couple of these projects. So, what do you think is the prognosis moving forward as we extend out six months, a year, two years? You know, where do you think these projects land? Okay, so. We saw it with Cool Cats. Everybody thought Cool Cats was going to be the cute IP that we get in stores that your kid is going to fall in love with and it's going to be the next, uh, you know, the next, like, toy that's in every store. But then Pudgy Penguins and Luca Nets came running out of nowhere to kind of say, hey, this is my niche that I'm going to take. So Luca Nets, I know, has some experience selling to walmarts and uh targets with his uh he had something called the gel blaster which i think is like a little plastic gun that shoots water or something so i think he's going to try and really push the merch angle similar to what v friends uh has started to do i don't follow that project v friends as much but i'm sure they deserve some of probably their own tier called the gary v zone but uh, that's that's not for me to talk about right now. But um, Pudgy Penguins are trying to develop their QIP uh, storytelling, like I said, target market of children. Same thing with Cool Cats, but they ran into an identity crisis. 
they they were a great brand. Everybody loved the cats. It had a lot going for them, but kind of overcomplicated themselves, putting too much on their plate uh, with the game. Another thing both of these brands do really well, both of these projects, I'll call them, is their symbols of positivity. I know Pudgy Penguin's extremely active on Instagram, which is unusual for a NFT project, but they don't even brand themselves as an NFT uh, on Instagram. It's just... Um, daily affirmations and positive thoughts uh, that they give their followers. So it's more of just like a cute meme page at this rate. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, something that strikes me here too, though, is that, you know, earlier on you were talking about, clients talking about digital crossover, right? That's what these guys are trying to do. So I, I kind of wonder if there's one of two pathways that exists here too, right? One is some kind of acquisition pathway across these, right? Maybe Pudgy acquires Cool Cats, cool cats because they already have the distribution and, and relationships to be able to go sell. And, oh, yeah, by the way, you know, one of these new brands having success in brick and mortar, you know, selling product or, you know, with drops or, or otherwise, is probably good for the others too, right? Because it's, it's some proof of concept that exists. That's one option. Other option, of course, is like, what about a, what about a toy manufacturer coming in? and operating like a Nike as it pertains to Clonex. What about like Mattel coming in and acquiring one of these and the IP behind it? Any any reactions to that? We've lost Koff again. He's speechless. Uh, that's how I'm taking it at least. <laughs> Bob, if we could hear you, uh, if you could hear us. Right. Uh, yeah, I, I guess I got to rejoin, quit and rejoin a couple times because uh, sometimes it just fades me out so that's strange but um my reaction to you saying maybe a mattel coming in i think that's where we left off uh, mattel coming in or an acquisition across these two right if pudgy already has the relationships with retailers for instance to be able to sell physical product right and then maybe the nfts of course gives you you know token gating and access as an example what about yeah. one of those yeah i think i think that is the dream for them right now um i think it's very attractive i saw throughout twitter that cool cats was shaking up the house uh if you guys noticed they fired a bunch of people um which seemed to be out of the blue so they definitely have a clear path that they're going on uh which we don't know yet with the new ceo so i could definitely see that being an option but as we know in this web3 space um it's very tight knit and word travels quickly. So, you know, it's a little risky to do that because people will hold a grudge about things like that. Uh, community members who have been on the team for a while, but it's going to be interesting to see the battle between pudgy and cool cats um, because they really do have similar uh, interests at mind. Like you said, getting acquired or outsourcing manufacturing um the one that i also want to uh you know talk about a little is chimpers too a lot of people sleep on the project but it does have a very good art based team that is a staking based project as well so uh concerning floor price and everything uh it does make moves easily but for the long-term outlook of it, uh, Chimpers is, they just had a deal that went through with 10 KTF. So they were added to their, uh, you know, list of brands that they collaborate with. And it is a standalone art project that's really done well. So anytime I see that where people really buy for the art in the community, it's something to, um, you know, keep the eye on in this, in this third tier category uh, another one that papa mentioned is the crypto dick bots uh you know that's a comparison to um crypto punks they're very similar in the way that they they are just community holding them up uh like an mfers uh so the crypto dick bots also fit into this category if you were to uh you know talk about them but they're really not going for anything more. So the pudgies, the cool cats, and the chimpers, they're going for more and trying to build their brand and carve their niche in this 
cute, uh, interesting adventure sector kind of marketing to a younger audience. These, you know, quote unquote, cute NFTs, right? This kind of space that they're occupying. How much extra space is there here? I mean, the question kind of came out live, which is talking about cannibalism and, you know, too much space or, or not, not a limit on, in the amount of space that exists within this niche, right? So are we at capacity here? Is there room for more projects that kind of fit into this category? What, what do you think? Here's a bold take. I think there is a lot more upward room for a project like Cool Cats or Pudgy Penguins in the way of brand building compared to a Moonbirds, an Azuki, a Digidaiku, uh yeah because these children's toys if you are able to get a hot children's toy we saw or i didn't see but i read about with the beanie babies back in the day growing up it was uh the two for me were club penguin which was just an online game uh and webkins if anybody remembers uh the webkins they get they got so hot where Everyone wanted one. Every kid wants one. And I know there's a lot of parents here. I mean, if your kid's constantly complaining about something like Christmas is coming up, you know, you got to get it for them. And uh, also saw that with ugly dolls back in the day uh, for me, where just, I just remember growing up, it was like, which one do you have? Which one do you have? Like, you got to get one. Uh, blah, blah, blah. So I could see that with pudgy penguins or cool cats, if they're able to utilize something like TikTok and Instagram to really build that cult audience and introduce some form of scarcity into the uh, products. I mean, they could really, really have that brand potential. Uh, even as recently as last year, uh, Squishmallows, I don't know if anybody knows those, but those toys had great resale value. I used to flip the Squishmallows. Um, so the toy market is huge, and there's lots of room for competitors to swoop in and steal their market share as well. Assuming you weren't around for Furbies when they came out also. I don't know if that name <laughs> resonates to anybody who's listening right now of Furbies, but that was like the mega version of of what you're talking about with a very short run, by the way. I think it lasted for like two months or something. But wow, yeah, I've heard the little... name. <laughs> um, so with, with all of this context in mind, right, of these being your top tiers, the ones with, you know, legs and sustainability and possibly upside, where do all these other projects fit in? Like, especially lately with, you know, all, all the new projects continuing to mint, obviously limited margin on most of them, some of them a little bit successful, right? Like, where, where do all these new projects fit in in your mind? Uh, most of them are going to zero. I can't lie. Uh, we see it a lot with um, the, I think, I think Papa likes to call it the shiny object theory, where the brand new thing, you want it, you need it, you need to have it. Um, there's not many projects that have a strong holder base and can maintain volume without putting out, um, you know, major announcements in every month, you know, it's really tough. And the NFT space, sadly, lately has reminded me of the sneaker space when it got too toxic and I had to leave it uh, because once you see everybody and their dog has their own uh, bot to buy things, I think that's pretty much time to stop minting uh, because I think I've gotten chilled in groups for about 50 different bots in the past month, you know? So once, once the bots really get to the bottom level of tech people like me, uh, you know, that's when you know it's a bit oversaturated and these free mints are just a bit too much. So I really try and buy mostly established projects or just flip the new thing that's out. And regarding other projects that I didn't mention, not all of them are going to zero. Like a big one that I couldn't really fit in a category was Meme Land. Um, I'd like to wait until the captain's mint to kind of see what their strategy is. Uh, but that would definitely like the meme on captains would probably fit in the secondary category. Uh, like as of now it's right below, uh, right below 
the secondary category, but it's it's just tough, you know. It's we don't give these creators enough credit um for going out there and launching a project. It's really hard to sustain it. Um, but at the same time, we have to be conscious uh when buying and selling. And remember, if something looks good or doesn't look great, like there's odds are it's not getting much volume for the rest of its life and it's probably on a trend to zero. That makes sense. And I, I don't think that's too unpopular of an opinion. I feel like most would probably agree with that. So all right, cough. So we lived in the last like hour and bit. We've got some bonus time today, as as we all know. Within the last hour, hour and a bit in our comfortable 2021 to 2022 world so far, okay? However, <laughs> all that said, where does Reddit fit into all of this? Any opinions? Ooh, on it? The Reddit. I love to hear it. So as we all know, Reddit really made a splash uh, with their, I think it was called the Season 2 collection or Drop 2 collection uh, about six days ago that just started pumping like crazy. So these new digital collectibles, it really reminded me of two things when I looked at the Reddit. It reminded me of Fortnite skins, which is funny when you think about it, but if people were around for early Fortnite back when it was a really good game, you know that the early season skins, some of them were the rarest in the game and most coveted, obviously. I think a similar thing may happen with these Reddit NFTs where at each drop point, you see a specific one or two, three different Reddit NFTs that, you know, really just become a grail of its season. And it's kind of like merging Fortnite skins with art blocks. So each season, you're going to get, I don't know, 10 drops from artists. And maybe one or two of those are just going to be immortalized. And it's like a good NFL draft class. You know, you don't know who's going to be the best player uh, until, you know, two, three years down the line. It may change. So for this, it's more like two, three months. But I do think it's something to pay attention to and scout out these new um, artists that are dropping. I know, I think it was. Uh, fuck render. If you, I've never said his name out loud. That's how I think that's how it's pronounced. But I know he expressed interest in doing a Reddit drop. So if they do do uh, drops with uh, you know well known artists bringing in from the Web two Web three space, it really could take off more, and it, it might be good to look back at those season one or season two drops and get you know, uh, an item you think had good volume and may stick. So I'm I'm pretty bullish on Reddit. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. What's interesting about it, too, is that it's coming, like, as you said, it's coming from a Web2 channel, right? So, like, I, I probably guess that almost everybody listening to this live or recorded thinks that social media also is going to be overhauled, right? Um, because it kind of needs to be for incentive systems and otherwise. And yet it's sitting on Reddit, right? Which is historically a Web2 platform. Um, obviously, you know, it's composable, right? And, and, and you have ownership and all that good stuff, but it's sitting on a Web2 platform. So it's interesting to see how it's, uh, you know, starting from there, originating from there. But likely not going to necessarily land there would be my guess, but, but who knows? I guess time will tell with that too. So maybe let's, you know, let's be cognizant of time and, and kind of... Um, everyone's time and wrapping up here, but where's your head at moving forward then cough, you know, for the next three, six, 12 months, you know, where are you, where are you paying attention? Would you have a strategy for the next three, six, 12 months? I guess, especially keeping in mind that the macro is still a little bit shaky, right? We still haven't hit in many people's eyes, full recession, let's call it right. Or, or, or that main mark. Where, where's your head at? He's speechless again. Um, without speech, <laughs> oh, whenever you're back, just holler. Yep, I'm back. I I don't. I think it's every time I don't talk for a minute, it starts to wane off. But um, my where my head is at is I implore everyone to take cash and put it aside and say 
this cash is never touching NFTs again. Leave it in a Coinbase transfer to your bank. Do what you want to do, but always make sure that you have the money to pay taxes plus double it, you know? Um, so that's number one, uh, because that could get really scary quick. Um, other than that, I always keep a DGEN fund of at least 10 ETH ready to throw at uh, projects on the daily for short-term uh, flips, because if you're, you know, if you're blessed and you did well, and you were able to accrue some ETH, um, you want to have a lot of it ready because sometimes some of those plays are just too easy to spot. And to really capitalize off of them, you want a decent chunk of ETH ready to spend. So uh, I do enjoy degening uh, a little bit like that, but my main focus is to build a long-term portfolio. So I've been stacking my vault with items such as uh, like a Tribe Diamond Pass, uh, like a Zan Can, uh, a 10 KTF item here or there. Some things that I feel are more safe and they could be good storages of ETH, um, like a QQL, uh, my profile picture currently. I minted one, as most of you guys know. But um, stuff like that, it's just... You take profits from the short term and then you add you 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 flip your short term investments, you put some profit in the bank, and then you add to the long term. So it's kind of like paying yourself and then paying yourself once again with an NFT that long term uh is a good storage of ETH and can return even more value. So that's where I am right now. You keep your DGEN funds, but you sell out quickly of uh, your DGEN plays, put some into your cold storage, and then chunk a few ETH here and here and there on some long-term plays. Kyle, I don't want to, I don't want to say anything here, but that's coming, kind of coming full circle to the start of our conversation about what percentage flipper and what percentage investor. You and it sounds like at least uh, <laughs> you're coming around to investor, but, but in all, all honesty, right, this is a theme that we're hearing from almost everybody. Everyone still wants to play the game. Most part, everyone wants to flip, but the risk tolerance of like building that up exponentially versus actually taking some off the table is certainly, you know, adapted for, for almost everybody. So it totally makes sense what you're saying. Uh, it's been an awesome, awesome episode um, and discussion that we had today. So, you know, I really appreciate it. I love the questions everybody had. Uh, everyone was also super kind and not uh, totally throwing tomatoes at cough along the way. I'm sure there's not a single person that totally agrees with with the structure or the rankings or tiering that he had. That's not the point, right? Like the the point, of course, is to just hear how he structures it and what his thought process is behind it. You just get one more framework to work off of, right? And so if your framework has different criteria and, and a different matrix, great. Like that's totally cool. Um, but Kof, really appreciate you coming on and sharing that and, and how you're thinking through all this and what your rationale is. It was super valuable for everybody listening. I certainly got value out of it. So really, really appreciate it. Thanks so much. And everybody listening live and of course recorded. Thank you so much as always. And we'll do similar time next week. We're floating a little bit these days on Thursdays, um, depending upon guests and, and audience timing. But we'll see you all next week on Thursday. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it. I appreciate all the comments in the chat, too. You guys are the best. I love MVHQ. Have a good one.